All right, so Hebrews chapter 4. And the key verse I want to draw your attention to in chapter 4 is verse 12. For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. A discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And so what I'm going to preach about tonight is saved by faith versus damned by unbelief. It's such a basic message, really. It's so foundational, though. This entire book is about Jesus Christ. So from Old Testament to New Testament, all the way through, this is about God. And this is about the fact that we are saved by faith or we are damned by unbelief. And when we look at Hebrews chapter 4, um, for starters, this whole chapter talks about the fact that we're saved by belief and that we're, we're damned by unbelief. Look at um, verses 2 and 3 of Hebrews chapter 4. It says, For unto us was the gospel preached as well as unto them, but the word preached did not profit them not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest, as he said, as I have sworn in my wrath, if they shall enter into my rest, although the works were finished from the foundation of the world. Go to verse 10. It says, for he that is entered into his rest, he also hath ceased from his own works as God did from his. So this chapter is completely reiterating the fact that we are saved by belief. It is not of our works. It is simply by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. And, you know, we're in Hebrews at this point, but this message has been going on from Genesis basically all the way through. So complete consistency. Look at the verses about unbelief. So again, in Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse 6. Seeing therefore it remaineth that some must enter therein, and they to whom it was first preached entered not in because of unbelief. Look at verse 11. Let us labor therefore to enter into that rest, lest any man fall after the same example of unbelief. So, I mean, it's just crystal clear. It is the message of the Bible. We are saved by grace through faith, and that not of ourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works lest any man should boast. And so one way that we get turned around as Christians is because there are so many distractions today and so many um, people that just are engaging in vain janglings and, and just these strange conversations, you know, you can get involved and sidetracked on certain issues to where if we would just come back to the foundation, which is that we're saved by faith and that we're damned by unbelief, a lot of these conversations would fly right out the window. And so that's what I'm hoping in the next hour to do is sort of dispel a little bit of that and just bring us back to the basic foundations where, you know, we understand sometimes some of the things that are confusing or seem confusing, they're only confusing because we're listening to a lot of commentary and a lot of people making comments where if we would just stick to the foundations of the Word of God, there wouldn't be anything confusing about it. Turn to Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 12. Ephesians chapter 1. Verse 12, it says that we should be to the praise of his glory who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after that ye believed, ye were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession under the praise of his glory. So it says that we were sealed with that Holy Spirit of promise. So God makes it really clear. Once we believe on Jesus Christ, we are sealed under the day of redemption. There is nothing that is going to take us out of the Father's hand. We are safe. We are secure. We believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn just a page or two over to Ephesians 4, um, verse 30. Ephesians 4, 30. And it just reiterates here in verse 30, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby ye are sealed unto the day of redemption. The believer is sealed eternally and saved 
by God and forever held by God. So, you know, um, you know we know in, in John chapter 10, is it verse 27? He, he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. So, you know, we know that we're safe and we're secure, and it's strictly by belief. So, being saved by faith, that's not really a point I need to belabor a whole lot with us here. Like, we grab onto that, we understand the concept of grace, and we understand completely that it's not by works. And I praise God that we're in a church that is so clear and concise about it, because the Bible is clear and concise about it. Turn to 2 Thessalonians. Let's take a look at damned by unbelief. Second Thessalonians chapter 2. <clears throat> Second Thessalonians chapter 2, let's start in verse number 8. And then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish, because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And so we read Hebrews 4, and it's so clear. You're saved by faith. You, you know, you're not going to enter into his rest by unbelief. You know, we can, we can look at um, all the different verses about saved by faith. And now here we have a set of verses that's saying, look, these people are done for. Um, for this cause, verse 11, God shall send them strong delusion that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth. Now, this is talking about the end times, of course, but the bottom line here is there is a point where God basically says, we're done, game over. You didn't believe me, you rejected it, we're done. In a sense, they're basically sealed to damnation. In the same way that we get sealed into the day of redemption and we're saved, you have people that simply, you know, call God a liar and they're going to be sealed unto damnation. They believe a lie. Um, Go ahead and turn to Jeremiah 6. Let's take a look at the word reprobate. Jeremiah 6. And a lot of you are real familiar with this. This is the first time the word reprobate is used in the Bible, which makes it a, a pretty good likelihood that it's going to give us a, a decent definition Jeremiah 6, starting in verse 28, it says, They are all grievous revolters, walking with slanders. They are brass and iron. They are corruptors. The bellows are burned. The lead is consumed of the fire. The founder melteth in vain, for the wicked are not plucked away. Reprobate silver shall men call them, because the Lord hath rejected them. And so we have... A lot of examples in the Bible where the Lord says you're rejected. It's just simply the truth. So you cannot look at things like 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You can't look at things like references from Jeremiah. There's all sorts of things in the New Testament. We're going to go over some of them where you have to do something with it. This churchianity idea of God that he wants everybody to be saved no matter what you've done in your life for the entire existence of your physical life here on earth, the Bible just blows holes in that all over the place. And so we're not talking about Calvinism here. Nobody is born reprobate. Nobody is born damned by God. Let's not confuse that in any way whatsoever. There is always cause and there is effect. So in every case where you see the Lord says, you have never, never forgiveness, or you know, you're not going to believe, or you're going to believe a delusion that I'm going to send to you. It was preceded by the individual closing their eyes and rejecting the truth of God. God does not just come out and decide, well, you don't get a chance at it. That is not the God of the Bible in any way, which is why we completely reject Calvinism in all points. Turn to Romans 1. 
I know, especially in this church, we are very familiar with Romans 1. I just want to point out an important thing here. Because when we talk about being damned by unbelief, Romans 1 is about people that will not believe. All right? I understand that what it shows is that the behavior that results from that is sodomites, homosexuality. But really, when you read what is actually being addressed here, what it's addressing is the heart of those individuals. So the actual behavior, it's just like a disease and the symptom, right? The disease is they've completely rejected God. The symptom is they're gonna engage in these vile and filthy acts. And so we don't wanna get the cart before the horse, but we need to recognize, you know, the New Testament was written, and what do you get? You get four gospels, you get the acts of the early church, and then the very first epistle you get, in the very first chapter, what does God do? He dedicates an entire half chapter to it to say, this is the heart of certain people, and this is the way they're going to behave. All right? This is a warning that's given to us from God, which actually we should see as a blessing, because God is able to say, look, this is who these people are. You can know for certain this is who they are and why they do what they do. And what's sad is most of churchianity today just sort of rejects it. They just sort of blow it off. And it's like God gave this to us for our learning and for our admonition. You're in Romans 1. Look at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. So boom, right off the bat, they take the truth and they say, nope, it's unrighteous. They, they take the truth and they call it a lie. Look at verse 20 and 21. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Because that, when they knew God, they glorified him not as God, neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations and their foolish hearts was dark and it's the same theme over and over again they're without excuse they know God they know who he is um, but they glorified him not as God and neither were thankful all right so again we're rejecting God rejecting God verse 25 who changed the truth of God into a lie and worshiped and served the creature more than the creator who is blessed forever amen again truth of God into a lie verse 28 and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. Verse 28, 29, being filled with all unrighteousness. Now, listen to this list of things. And what you'll notice is most of what you're reading here. It's not always a specific action. It actually just has to do with the heart. Because that's what Romans 1 is about. It's about the heart of the individual. Verse 29, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, whispers, backbiters, haters of God, despiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, without understanding, covenant breakers, without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful. As you read through that list, it's not describing so much this action, that action, this action. It's describing this is their character. This is who they are. This is the way they think about things. And so Romans 1 truly is about the heart of man. And, and so at no point in this, I didn't even get into the verses about, you know, men burning in their lust one towards another and doing, you know, doing those things that are in, unseemly and, and, and all of that. That's just sort of the end result of this character towards God that just says, I reject you in its entirety. So it's so important that we grab just onto that and understand it solidly that when God rejects individuals, he does so because those individuals completely rejected him first. And God is a perfect judge. If we go back to Hebrews 4.12, where we know that the word is sharp and powerful and quicker than any two-edged sword, when we understand that it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart, is there any question that God is able to look at individuals and say 100% they've totally rejected me? There's a, it's, not, it's not like there's a 1% chance that God got it wrong. When he says they've rejected me, it's a done deal. So we want to come in behind that sometimes in churchianity and try to 
kind of twist that around or put a different spin on it or a different feel on it because we're kind of just selling out sometimes to these paraphrases and these general ideas that it sounds great, but it doesn't really mesh up with Scripture. You'll hear things like, well, nothing is impossible with God. Well, but apparently you're saying for God to declare that somebody's totally rejected him is impossible. Apparently, you saying that, you know, God says, well, you hath never forgiveness, that's impossible. So they're deciding kind of what is impossible. What they're really saying is God is just love. And therefore, we just have to say that every single person on the face of the planet, no matter who they are or what they think about God, still has time to repent and believe. But the problem with that is there's too many passages in Scripture where it's really clear that God is saying they're done. There's that. Not only am I, I not going to be able to do anything for them, I'm going to make sure they don't believe because they've gone too far. That is not God's fault. That is man's fault. And, and these are the men that do that. Turn with me to Matthew 13. I'm trying specifically to stay in the New Testament here because with so many of the naysayers, they want to like act as if the Old Testament God is different than the New Testament God, and he's not. So I purposely want to stick here. Look at Matthew 13. I'm going to read verses 1 through 3, and then we're going to skip to, to verse 10. So 1 through 3, it says, The same day when Jesus out of the house and sat by the seaside, and great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore, and he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. I'm going to stop there. I'm not going to go through the whole parable, but just get a picture here. You know, these are the multitudes, all right? So we just have a big, huge group of people. Skip down to verse number 10. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speakest thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it is not given. For whosoever hath, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundance. But whosoever hath not, from him shall be taken away even that he hath. Therefore, I speak to them in parables, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing ye shall hear, and shall not understand. And seeing ye shall see, and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. But blessed are your eyes for they see and your ears for they hear. For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. So the question becomes, when you're reading this, when you go back to verse 15 and he says, For this people's heart is wax gross and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and should understand with their heart and should be converted and I should heal them. Jesus is saying, I'm giving it to you in parables because these people, you know what? I'm speaking it in parables because they've already their hearing has grown dull, right? Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And these people have already closed their ears down. Pay attention, it says, and their eyes they have closed. So he already knew Jesus Christ is God. God has infinite knowledge. I guarantee you he could stand in front of all of creation and every single person out there, immediately he can know the exact state of everybody's heart. Right? Because the word of God is the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. When Jesus Christ came to this earth, he purposely limited himself in some ways. But we can clearly see from scripture, he supernaturally knew all sorts of details about all sorts of people. So if you don't think that he was able to stand there and give out those parables and understand... This parable is perfect because this parable is going to reach out to the people who will receive it and it will keep the ears shut and the eyes closed of the people that already never wanted to hear it in the first place. Look at verse 17. It says, For verily I say unto you that many prophets and righteous men have desired to see those things which ye see and have not seen them and to hear those things which ye hear and have not heard them. 
He's talking about prophets and righteous men. How is anybody made righteous? By believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, all right? Believing in God, and it's accounted unto you for righteousness. So he's talking about Old Testament prophets, righteous men that believed God, and he's saying they would have loved to have heard this stuff. They would have taken this and ran with it. They would have taken this wisdom and just been that much stronger for me because of it. They would have loved to have heard this, and yet you're hearing it, and you know what? It's just like, but doing like whatever, you know. So Christ knew this. So we have to get rid of this idea that Christ does not have the power or the ability or the right to judge individuals prior to a physical death. All right. So, I mean, let's face it. There are people on this earth today that are going to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ and they're not necessarily reprobate. It's not that they've all just totally out of hand rejected God, but God knows for a fact that even though they don't totally reject him, they're going to go to their grave having never accepted him either. That's not Calvinism. That's just God understanding. Some of these people are going to believe and some aren't. And when the people, when their hearing is, has grown dull and they've closed their eyes, there is a point where Christ just says, that's fine. I'll make sure I give it to you to where I just assure the fact that you're not going to believe because you've been given more than many men who came before you who fully believed on me. So, and that's the thing we got to remember. We're living in a day, we have the complete Bible in front of us. As much as any men in history, we have more information, um, more of the solid word of truth to let us believe. So if ever there was a point in human civilization where we're without excuse, it's today. Everybody can get a Bible. If you got a dollar, you can go to the Dollar Tree and get a Bible. All right, that, that would have been a huge privilege back then. Turn to 2 Peter chapter 3 real quick. 2 Peter chapter 3. Look at verse 9. I know we all know this. I just want to remind you of this. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long-suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And so we never forget the backdrop. God does want everybody to be saved. That never changes. And so when he starts taking these actions where he says, I'm going to say it in a way that you're not going to hear it or you're not going to see it, you can better believe those people have gone too far. On whatever scale God judges that, he judged it righteously and he judged it exactly the way he was supposed to. And so, you know, let's not, you know, get turned around the axle the wrong way here and think that this isn't like God saying, well, certain people just are never going to get a chance to hear the gospel. You know, when that doesn't happen, that's shame on us. That's exactly the opposite of what he told us. We're to preach the gospel to every creature. He wants everybody to have that opportunity. So, um, but it... We, we, we accept the fact that God wants everybody to be saved, but we also don't deny the fact that God has the power and ability to judge people even before their physical death. Um, so I want to cover one other thing because, you know, we have salvation by faith and we have damned by unbelief. And I, I think the Bible is really clear on that. But I also want to look at unpardonable sin, you know, an unforgivable sin versus being reprobate. And some of those things can kind of slide one over the other, but I think people get some of this stuff backwards and get confused on it. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. <clears throat> this church and a lot of churches that believe like we do, we get attacked a lot for a lot of the doctrine that is totally in keeping with the King James Bible. And it's because people want to make these straw man arguments that honestly are just out of hand. They're ridiculous. And so I kind of want to take a look at that. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 9. Know ye not that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. So just stop right there for a second. The unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. The unrighteous are those that don't believe. That's what the Bible says all the way through. He, I mean, honestly, you could stop right there, and that's really all you need to know. The unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God. 
But it goes on, and he gives descriptions of the unrighteous. Be not deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor abusers of themselves with mankind, nor thieves, nor covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor extortioners, shall inherit the kingdom of God. And such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of of our God. And so keep a finger there and go with me to Romans 4. You got to just go back one book, go to Romans 4, but keep your finger in 1 Corinthians 6 because we're going to pop right back to it. Romans 4, let's look at verses 3 through 5. For what saith the scripture? Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Now to him that worketh is the reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. So again, crystal clear. Go back to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. What does it say? Know ye not... In verse 9, that the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Go down to verse 11. It says, And such were some of you, but ye are washed, ye are sanctified, ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. And so, it's so basic and so simple. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, when you look at the full context of it, you got just a couple things going on here. It begins by talking about the fact that people within the church should not be judged by people outside of the church. The second big part of it is it's talking about the fact that fornicators shouldn't be in the church. And, and, it, and it, what it's doing here is it's also using a word structure and it's using a dynamic that the Word of God often uses where it says something like the unrighteous, which we know is really just those who don't believe God. But then it gives examples of who the unrighteous is. Turn to Revelation chapter 21. Revelation 21. We use this verse, Revelation 21, 8, we use this all the time in soul winning. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That verse, if you would just put the second one there, but the unbelieving shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. That really covers it. If you read the whole Bible, you understand those who believe go to heaven and those who don't believe go to hell. But what God does, as he so often does in his word, is he gives additional descriptions of these are the type of people. Now look, we know we've all told a lie. And we all know that probably between now and the time we die, we're probably going to tell another lie. So if we were to hold this to what the action is and say, this, these actions actually dictate who goes to hell, then salvation by grace is dead, right? I mean, it isn't salvation by grace. We're back to actions. We're back to works. Well, when you go to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, where it's talking about the fact that they're all justified and they're washed, they're all believers, and then to take this list of actions. Now, remember, Romans 1 was primarily a list of the heart of men. It was what was in their heart. Then we get to 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and not only is it not talking about people who are damned, it's talking about people who believe and are in the church, and it's using a list of different things that really are actions. Fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners. I mean, am I crazy? Or that's primarily all actions. I mean, you have a couple in there that you could say, well, that's just sort of a heart thing, but same thing with Romans. It's almost all heart stuff with a couple of actions in there. So salvation is by faith. Damnation is by unbelief. And what we have today is people who are kind of like trying to make these connections here to twist around Scripture. And what happens so often with 1 Corinthians 6, 9, is if I'll point out, you know, nor abusers of themselves with mankind. And what they want to do is they want to take that term and somehow say that the people in Romans 1 are the same people who are in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, because what they want to do is they want to take the Sodomites from Romans 1 and bring them straight into the church. And it is such a strange twisting of doctrine. It is such a strange twisting of what any of that stuff means. Um, 
Abusers of themselves with mankind, think about this. That is a vague statement, all right? That, what does that actually mean? When they're listing this right here, could not a woman be abuser of herself with mankind, right? A prostitute is an abuser of themselves with mankind. Abusers of themselves with mankind, let's not forget the translators of the Bible were very intelligent. They could have used the word sodomite. They could have used the word burned in their lust one towards another. They purposefully, those words were not used. And no matter how you want to slice it, these are actions. And, and what this really ought to serve to do, because what the world wants to say is, you're turning homosexuality into an unpardonable sin. What they're saying is, if somebody commits these acts out of Roman 1, you're saying that God's blood isn't sufficient to save them. I've literally heard that argument. What they try to act like we're doing is that we're corrupting the gospel of Christ, so that we're saying there's a sin that Christ didn't pay for. I got news for you. Whosoever shall believe and whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. There is not a single act of fornication that Christ did not pay for. And the Bible never says that any sort of fornication is an unpardonable sin, and that's not what we preach here anyways. So we, what they're doing is they're creating this straw man argument, abusers of themselves with mankind. Look, I don't mean to be like rough or say something gross, but do you think for two seconds there hasn't been a meth addict or a crack addict who hasn't done something disgusting and vile to get enough money to pay for their next fix? Wouldn't that be an abuser of themselves with mankind? Does that mean that they're burning in their lust towards other men? Men do desperate things when they're in bondage to sin. There's, you know, just people have had weird experience. They have to, I look at 1 Corinthians 6, 9, and it's so obvious. You're talking about believers, and you know what this says? This says to the individual that maybe had a strange event or had a checkered past, who's, you know, clearly can look at the Word of God and say, yes, homosexuality is wrong. Yes, I am not burning in my lust one toward another. But they had some weird things that happened, and they can look at this, and they can say, you know what, the action doesn't condemn me. It's my heart that saves me or condemns me. And that actually, this should be something where we're taking it to people and taking the gospel to people and people that have sort of these questions about, you know, well, I did this and I did that. Look, if you'll just believe, you're saved. Right? But all of that gets turned on its head, and all of a sudden, Romans 1 is just about if you're a sodomite, when really it's about the heart of people that hate God. You know, and 1 Corinthians 6 9 is about homosexuals being in the church, and it's like, that actually has nothing to do with this entire passage. But we fall into these arguments and we chase these rabbits down the hole. And, and the problem is churchianity is propagating it, right? Because they want to bring everybody in and they want to propose all these things. And the problem is now you're bringing the Romans 1 people into the church. And, and, and you're actually destroying the very institution you think you're upholding because you want to have just this general idea about who God is instead of reading what he said. So um, it's just a false argument. It's apples to oranges. And, and so understanding an unpardonable sin versus, you know, God describing, look, these people are reprobate. They've already rejected me. We, we have to understand that nobody in any of these churches is talking about any type of fornication being an unpardonable sin. But the bottom line is they've rejected God in their hearts. And so Romans 1, those individuals, however you want to define abusers of themselves with mankind, Go for it. But I'll tell you this right now. You would be insane to say that the individuals in, in Romans, in, in 1 Corinthians 6, 9, are the same individuals as those in Romans 1. You got people who completely reject God, and then you got people who are saved. It's not the same group of people. So I don't, I don't, it doesn't really matter how you define it. And, you know, you'll hear people say things like, oh, well, the Greek of it means two men couched together. Okay, is that an action or is that a heart? Right? In other words, is it, does, does two men couch together even describe the heart of the individuals, or does it describe an action? Are we damned by action? No, we're damned by our heart. So stop bringing action terms to me. Stop bringing works to me and telling me, you know, this proves it one way or the other. The entire Bible is about we're saved by grace through faith. So you're drawing all these little lines and getting a lot of people confused on something that really, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and 
chapter 5 doesn't have anything really to do to relate to Romans 1. But this world wants to draw this connection because they both touch on things that have to do with sexual sin. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 5, starting in verse 9. I wrote unto you in an epistle not to company with fornicators, yet not altogether with the fornicators of this world, or with the covetous, or extortioners, or with idolaters. For then must ye needs go out of the world. But now I have written unto you not to keep company. If any man that is called a brother be a fornicator, or covetous, or an idolater, or a railer, or a drunkard, or an extortioner, with such an one know not to eat. For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without God judgeth. Therefore put away from among yourselves that wicked person. So again, the simplicity of what God teaches us through the epistles. We are saved by grace. We are not saved by works. We are not damned by any work if we are willing to believe the gospel. If we will call out to Christ, we will be saved. And as it concerns the church, fornicators are not allowed in the church. We don't want revilers. We don't want drunkards. We don't want extortioners. And so all these little what-ifs and hypotheticals that people get into, it's so simple. We really don't have all these big issues, but, but what's happening now is the church, because they want to say this, false line of, well, you're saying there's sins that can't be forgiven. Now they're going to welcome in the very people that go right against 1 Corinthians 5 and act like they're doing the work of God. And meanwhile, you're completely violating the word of God and turning it upside down. Nobody, <clears throat> let's take a look at unpardonable sins real fast. Matthew 12. Fornication is not an unpardonable sin. Let's look at the ones that are. There aren't very many of them. And you know, it's interesting because people will have a hard time taking reprobate doctrine, um, but they don't have a hard time taking unpardonable sin as a doctrine. And I think part of the reason for that is there's enough stuff going on there that they feel like you can't really pin that on anybody. And that's what it all comes down to. They don't really want to accept the fact that there are certain things where God says, you're done. You haven't even passed away from this earth and you're done for. Matthew 12, look at verse 31. Wherefore I say unto you, all manner of sin and blasphemy shall be forgiven unto men, but the blasphemy against the Holy Ghost shall not be forgiven unto men. And whosoever speaketh a word against the Son of Man, it shall be forgiven him, but whosoever speaketh against the Holy Ghost, it shall not be forgiven him, neither in this world, neither in the world to come. I remember after I got saved, when I first read that verse, it scared me so bad. And I remember my dad, he had, a, um, he had a, a little apartment triplex that he rented in Whittier, California. And there was a tenant there that I knew was a Christian. He had lived there like 10 years. He was like the only tenant that didn't give my dad just a boatload of problems. Just consistent, paid the rent. He was a bodybuilder, just a, a cool guy. And, and he knew the word of God fairly well from what I could tell. And I remember being over there. I was like water in the lawns or something. And I said to him, I said, you know what, I'm kind of nervous that maybe at some point I blasphemed the Holy Ghost. And I was already saved at this point, right? But it, it was just, the verse scared me so bad. And I remember him just saying to me, he's like, what are you worried about? You're fine. Don't even worry about it. Now, he didn't give me a good explanation about it, but it, what I know he understood completely is we're saved by belief. We're not saved by... The very fact that I was nervous about it was a really good sign that I feared God and that obviously I wasn't reprobate. So it wasn't one of those things where... Um, you know, he asked me a bunch of questions, everything else. He was just like, what are you even worried about? You know, uh, somebody who is saved cannot commit an unpardonable sin because that, that would end up contradicting God and make God a liar. That's not going to work out. So blaspheming the Holy Ghost, you know, there's some debate over exactly what that means or exactly how that can happen. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, that's, a, that's an unpardonable sin. Um, it's not something that... Um, it, it, it's not like what we're talking about with people just fully rejecting God in the sense that, um, you know, it's a one-time event that may work 
with being a reprobate and it may not. In other words, there could be people that already have fully rejected God and then can commit the unpardonable sin. There can be some people that commit the unpardonable sin and at that point they go over the edge. But again, that's not really our concern because God's the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. So we should take this and fear it and understand this is a serious thing that God is talking about. We don't even want to tiptoe in the direction of any unpardonable sin. But at the end of the day, you know, an unpardonable sin or being reprobate, you know, the two can work together, but they can also sort of, everybody who commits an unpardonable sin is reprobate. But there are some people who are reprobate that may or may not have committed an unpardonable sin, if that makes right. sense. Okay, because God can judge that heart and know if he's been thoroughly rejected, regardless of whether or not they blaspheme the Holy Ghost. Look at Revelation 22. Revelation 22, verse 18 and 19. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. You know, you start messing around with the Word of God and God says we're done. Because what you're doing is you're taking the very thing that man needs to believe and to have salvation and you're completely destroying it. You're corrupting it. There are going to be a lot of people that are going to bust the gates of hell wide open because of these corrupted Bible versions and the things they've done. You know, I had little forays of sort of stepping into going back to church before I really went back consistently. And I remember there was one church I went to um, this guy named Verl that I knew, really nice guy. Do you remember Verl, Shauna? Yeah, nice guy. Um, I, you know, and he was saved, and, but this was like a community church. And I remember um, we had this, like it was a Thursday night Bible study. And it was just the men. Go to Matthew 5 real quick. And, I'll, it, you know, and this is so crazy now. I look at it, I just think, what on earth? And even at the time... I didn't know much, but I knew something was sort of weird about it. If you go to Matthew 5, look at verse 22. And keep in mind, this is one of those Bible studies where we all had a different Bible. Like, I know I wasn't even in a King James at that time. I got saved with the King James, but I had, I think I actually had what it was called, like, God's Word. Like, that was actually the generic term for it. And uh, I'm sure it was a total train wreck. But we went to Matthew 5, 22, and it says, But I say unto you that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of the judgment, and whosoever shall say to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council, but whosoever shall say, Thou fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. This pastor at this church, I kid you not, was talking about the attitude we should have towards other believers, and he said, and guys, where it says that, that whosoever is angry with his brother without a cause, you know, you should just take your pencil and just line through right there without a cause. Because really, you just you shouldn't be angry at your brother ever for any reason. Now, when you think about what it says in Revelation about not removing any words from the... That should scare you. Like, th there should be no way you're tiptoeing in that direction where you're... Now, am I saying that that guy is damned for... No, I'm not necessarily saying that, but, but here's the thing. God discerns the heart. Here's what I would be concerned about. Those that are actually making new Bible versions and publishing them and sending them out and saying this is the word of God, now you definitely have an issue. As a pastor, he is especially responsible for instructing all of us who were sitting there to do that. And you know what? I took a pencil and put a line through it. Am I scared that I'm going to hell? No, <laughs> because I know my own heart. I know that God saw my heart and I know that really I was this babe in Christ that was just sort of listening to this man who was preaching. And as I learned more, you know, now if somebody would have instructed me of that, I wouldn't have even finished the Bible study. It'd be like, see you, we're out of here, right? So God's able to discern those things. But again, that's where it always comes back to, even with unpardonable sins, they're in indication of a heart that's already turned against God. Finally, Revelation 14. Let's look at it real quick. And this hasn't happened yet. It will happen in the future. Revelation 14, verse 9 through 11. 
And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night, who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. You know, this is going to happen. And you know what's even crazier about it? God has preserved his word, and his word's going to be around even in that day. And I guarantee you, there's going to be people that know this word and know what it says, and they're still going to take the mark of the beast. Why? Because they don't believe the word. Because if they really believed it, they'd never do it, right? But that's exactly what it comes down to. So unpardonable sins, those who have already believed and have trusted in Jesus Christ, you know, whatever blaspheming the Holy Ghost might be, you know, whatever removing words from the Word of God might be, whatever taking the mark of the beast looks like, nobody who's saved is going to do that. Because God can work that out. God knows how to make that happen to where there will be no contradiction. And those that do it, you know, some of them, I'm sure, are going over the edge at the time they do it. And some of them were already over the edge. And it's just an indication of what was already in their heart. So that being said, you know, just to wrap up, you know, we are saved by faith. We are damned by unbelief. Don't confuse these concepts of being reprobate, rejected by God because you've rejected God yourself with necessarily having committed an unpardonable sin just because people are going to get you wrapped around the handle the wrong way. All right. So, um, <clears throat> you know, like I said, fornication is not um, in, in any form. Fornication is not this unpardonable sin. But if you read Romans 1, you cannot deny that certain types of fornication are only the result of a reprobate person, somebody who's rejected God. And when you don't let people deter you from that and you keep those items in place, then all these other arguments just sort of fly out the window. Don't allow the what ifs to dictate the meaning of Scripture. I knew a pastor that understood reprobate doctrine and he believed it and he changed his mind because he counseled somebody whose life story he felt contradicted what he thought he knew about the Bible. In other words, he took the witness of an individual and said, well, this doesn't mesh up with scripture. So instead of sort of questioning what that individual was saying, he said, well, I must be understanding scripture wrong. That's so backwards. It's crazy. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. We do not judge the Bible by the witness of man. We judge man by the Bible. I mean, that should just be blatantly obvious. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verses 12 and 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God, which things also we speak, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth, but which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Right? So we're comparing spiritual things with spiritual. Turn to 1 John chapter 5. Just to back this up a little bit. 1 John chapter 5, look at verse 9. If we receive the witness of men, the witness of God is greater. For this is the witness of God which he hath testified of his Son. He that believeth on the Son of God hath the witness in himself. He that believeth not God hath made him a liar, because he believeth not the record that God gave of his Son. And this is the record, that God hath given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. We use this verse so often in soul winning because the record is that God hath given, that's a gift, to us eternal life, which means it never ends, and this life is in His Son, which means it's only through Jesus Christ. And you know, as I read over this, we could add even one more component to it, and this is the record that God, capital G, here's the thing, if you misrepresent who God is, then it's not the God of this Bible. In other words, if you want to take your own little twisted interpretation and say, well, I knew somebody, 
you know, that looked like they were. By the way, the, this person that I'm thinking about, and he's just one of probably half a dozen I've dealt with, who said, well, I think the Sodomites can be saved because they gave me this testimony. Well, what do they always go to? 1 Corinthians 6, 9. Well, abusers of themselves with mankind. They're grabbing for straws. They're trying to pull this stuff out of context because they're desperately trying to fit somebody's witness about their own life into the scriptures. But here's the thing. The scriptures don't lie. So when Romans 1 says, these people have rejected me thoroughly, all right, and 1 Corinthians 6, 9 simply says, look, these are believers. These are not people that have rejected me thoroughly. Guess what? When you hear a testimony from a human being that seems to contradict that in some way, somebody's lying and it's not God. Amen. It's not the Bible, all right? And, and to further that, you have to understand this. There are people that try to honestly tell you what their life experience is and their wisdom. They don't even understand themselves. I mean, do you understand that we're even confused about how we really think and, and why our emotions are what they are? And so when they try to communicate, so they may not even be trying to be deceptive, but they may not even be communicating to you exactly who they are or how these things come about and not even know it. So it would be foolish to take the word of God and say, well, you know, God gave them over. We got to kind of throw that to the side because I know so-and-so over here and they say they did this. And th No, you know. And the funny thing is how full circle it goes. I actually saw, I saw somebody at, you know, a sodomite pride parade and, and he was screaming about the fact that people that were subject, I think he called it sexual orientation therapy. This is where you basically try to take somebody who professes to be a sodomite and turn them into a heterosexual. He said that they are eight times more likely to commit suicide. Well, no kidding. Because when you try to tell them that what they're doing is wrong and they need to change and stop being a homosexual and start being a heterosexual, all you're beating into them is what they already know, which is that they're going against nature. What they're doing is wrong. It's like, yeah, no duh. The only people that are thinking you can pray the gay away is the churchianity crowd, right? It's, it's literally the feel-good crowd that wants to reject the reprobate doctrine in Romans 1. So it's funny to me, because when you actually accept God at his word and just take what he actually says about certain groups of people, and then you'll actually hear that same group of people saying, I can't change the way I am, I'm not going to change... They're right. That's what the Bible says. So what are you doing trying to convince them to do something where God just said, yeah, they're done for. They know they're done for. Let them be done for. All right? It, it's, it's, it's bizarre. So if God gave them up, we're not bringing them back. So stop playing these games. If you would know the scriptures, you wouldn't waste your time doing that. You're just making the sodomites mad and you're not accomplishing anything. And then on top of it, you're bringing them into the church. So you're just, you're messing the whole thing up. Finally, commentary can complicate our understanding. And so, you know, when you look at Romans 1, it, it, it's one of these things where he's giving us a clear warning. He's saying, if you see this type of individual, you know, don't associate with them. They're enemies of God. You know, we should be thankful for that warning. And likewise, you know, when you deal with those individuals, when you understand they're reprobate, <laughs> some of the most foolish stuff I see is people preaching at them and trying to shame them. If you really believe they're reprobate, what's the point? It's not going to do any good anyways. It's like you're poking a dog with a stick. Just leave them alone. They're going to live their life the way they want to live their life. We have nothing to do with them. They're not going to get saved. Let them be. You know, and, and all these bleeding heart evangelicals that want to act like they should be given the gospel, none of them are going out soul winning. So they talk this big talk about how everybody needs the gospel. They try to shame the people that believe the word of God. And then in the meantime, they're not actually walking the walk and doing anything about it. You know, when I first heard about Jesus' soul going down to hell, it completely confused me because nobody had ever preached it. And I thought, what's going on here? What are you talking about Jesus' soul in hell? But I'd read Acts 2 and see how Peter reiterated it over and over again. And I see in Psalm 16 what they're talking about. I'd see Jesus talk about Jonah being three days and three nights in the heart 
of the whale and, and go back to Jonah and see how he's talking about out of hell he cried out. I'd go to Leviticus you know, 5 and 6 and look at how a sin offering was always, the sacrifice was being bled and then burnt with fire. And all of a sudden you're realizing, wait a minute, if the penalty has to be paid and the penalty is hell and God's not just giving us a get out of jail free card, but he's actually paying the penalty it almost wouldn't make sense if his soul didn't go to hell for three days and three days. And all of a sudden, something that you just thought was wacky and didn't fit, you're reading the Bible and you're realizing this makes absolute, total, perfect sense. But what we do is we let the commentary confuse us on what the Bible says extremely clearly. And so when it comes to being saved by faith versus being damned by unbelief, it's like the Bible is crystal clear about all these things. In a few exceptional cases, God actually says, look, you can actually know these individuals are damned. And then in today's world, because of politics and because of commentary and because of political correctness, we turn this on its head and we end up hurting the church from within instead of just having the guts to say, this is what God says, this is what we're going with. So turn to 2 Peter chapter 1. This is the last verse and we'll be done for the night. Second Peter chapter 1. Look at verse 16. For we have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when there came such a voice to him from the excellent glory. This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. And this voice which came from heaven we heard when we were with him in the holy mount. We have also a more sure word of prophecy, whereunto ye do well that ye take heed, as unto a light that shineth in a dark place until the day dawn and the day star arise in your hearts, knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation, for the prophecy came not in old time by the will of man, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. This is so powerful because Peter is saying in verse 16 and 17, he's saying we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. We saw him and yet what we have here is a more sure word of prophecy. He's literally saying the stuff I saw with my own eyes is not as reliable as this actual word of God. Think about what that means. This is an apostle. This is a prophet of God saying this to us. And so it doesn't matter what the witness of, you know, anybody out in the world says. It doesn't matter what some individual's testimony is about, you know, who they were then and who they are now. This is the word of God. So it stands true. It stands correct. And if we would just put our faith in exactly what this says and stop placing the witness of individuals over the word of God. You know, I'll tell you this. When I first got, I, I know that I'm bringing up the whole sodomite thing a lot. The problem is it's thrown in our face so much. And I'll tell you something, there's two big dangers in our world because those that call God a liar, those are the ones that are going to hell. And here's the thing, most people are not calling God a liar by becoming a Satanist and blaspheming God and saying, I hate God. Most people are calling God a liar simply by God declaring this is right and this is wrong. And you say, well, no, it's not wrong. All right. So abortion is one big one. We're killing babies every day. And this whole woman's right to choose, woman's right to choose, they can't even have a logical argument because they know if they even pursue it two steps in, it's ridiculous, right? But this is what we do. We convince ourselves that it's a civil right. The second big way as a nation and as much of the world has done is we've taken sodomites and we've turned it from being a moral issue into a civil issue, right? We've turned it into a civil rights type war. Here's the thing. If you can get people completely on board just saying, well, they were born that way. Well, you know, that in and of itself isn't a sin. Well, you're calling God a liar. You've taken something where God has said this is wrong and you're saying, well, no, it's not wrong. Do you understand? You just rejected God and God didn't even come into the conversation. Like when you, when you start realizing that you're taking values and you're absorbing them and accepting them and they're totally contrary to the word of God, 
The, the devil loves that. The devil is most profitable in getting people into hell through subtlety. He's not doing it by this straightforward, you know, 666 horns and all this other stuff. He's doing it by subtly just getting your mindset to the point where you just say, well, that can't be right. And meanwhile, God is saying, no, that's exactly right. Super dangerous. That's why we ought to be offended when we have churches that call themselves Christian and they just want to sort of trample on all of this stuff and avoid sin and avoid it. You know, that's why we do both things here at this church. You know, salvation is as easy as can be. It's, it's just believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and we will never bend on that. And when it comes to sin, we need to preach hard against sin. The standards have not changed. The God of the Old Testament is the God of today. All those standards still hold true. And so we're going to keep preaching hard against sin as believers that believe it. And at the same time, we're going to take people the gospel. We're not going to confuse it with actions or with works. We are saved by faith. We are damned by unbelief. It is the foundation of who we are. And don't let anybody distract you with these straw man arguments. Amen? Amen. All right, let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for this weekend. We thank you so much for your word. I pray, God, that... You would help us to throw aside so much of the commentary and just dig into your word, Lord. And God, I know sometimes some of these doctrines are, are hard to understand and work through. Um, but God, you, you see our hearts and you know when we're trying to understand things and you give us wisdom and understanding if we would just ask for it. So I just pray that you help each one of us to read our Bibles more, to ask you for wisdom, that you would just further enlighten us. And give us understanding that we might go out in the world and be a bright light for you. And Lord, finally, we just thank you too um, for Pastor and for his wife and for their family. We thank you for delivering their child safely today. What a blessing. We love you, Lord, and thank you for all the ways you bless us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. All right.